Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for joining us for another artist talk uh, with 934 Gallery. Um, thank you again so much for your uh, comments and your questions that you submitted on Facebook this week for our artists. We're going to get to some of those. Um, I'd like to invite everybody to check out uh, 934gallery.org for information about this show and other upcoming shows. Uh, as a reminder, 934 Gallery is a 100% uh, volunteer run organization here in Columbus, Ohio. So if you like what you see and you want to donate, feel free to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started with our uh, artist talk this afternoon. I'd like to introduce Sky and Aaron, as well as Andy. Um, why don't we go ahead and get some introductions off the bat? Um, Sky, do you mind introducing yourself? Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm Sky Day. Um, I use they, them pronouns. Um, I went to Col Columbus College of Art and Design here in Columbus um, for my, my BFA and I just graduated in um, 2019 with BFA in Fine Arts and a minor in Creative Writing. Um, the past six months I was at, and I was an artist in residence at Bunker Projects in Pittsburgh. And then I worked as a work trade farmer on an organic farm in Rhode Island on an intentional community. Um, and then last week I came back here to Columbus to focus on painting more. And so now I'm back in Columbus. Thanks. I definitely want to focus on some of that residency work later on in this artist talk. I have yeah. some questions regarding residencies in general. So thank you, Erin. Um, Give a chance to introduce yourself to our uh, viewers today. Sure, uh, I'm Erin. I did my BFA at Ohio Wesleyan University, and then I did my MFA in printmaking at The Ohio State University. Uh, let's see, for the last six months, uh, I've basically just been trying to use this time at home to get in the studio a little bit more um, besides work. Uh, so I'm just trying to use that free time to make some more, some more things. Well, um, first off, I had a chance to uh, view uh, the show both uh, online during the virtual opening and recently at the gallery. I was able to stop in during one of our open hours, which is every Saturday, noon to three, and see your work. Um, you uh, were unaware of each other before this point, correct? You guys did not know each other. Right. Um, but uh, you know the the juror selection process thought that your work um, would be pretty nice together. I know Sky was meant to be with another person earlier this uh, uh, year, but then when we saw Aaron's work too, we thought that this would be a good um, work, kind of uh, reflecting off of one another. And we see a lot of that. Um, sort of warping of imagery uh, in both of your works. Um, Sky, your, your work gets a little warped with, the, with a dream landscape, and Erin, your work gets warped with the, the image of self. Um, have these both been uh, things that you've explored in your work previous to this point? Um, I guess I'll go first. Um, yeah, I would say that kind of bringing together different types of imagery and kind of making something new out of it, sort of warping it, like you said, um, that is pretty essential to my process. Um, just kind of the way that I combine imagery to it, it sort of distorts the figure or, you know, changes things in a certain way to fit, you know, the goal that I have in mind for the image. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question. I, um, I mean, I've, I guess I've been like working in that way for a while and it's been like, I've been exploring that and a lot of it has to do with exploring something I call like the memory scape and um, you can also say like a dream space as well. Um, and using, cause it's either like remembering dreams or remembering past events. And then like, how does memory or the dream space distort um, landscape or distort figures or distort colors? And um, like how do things seem different when we like recall them or um, experience them again? Um, or an experience in a dream space or a not real place. Um, and so that's kind of like where my like surreal like imagery comes from, I guess, or like the um, distortion of that. So. Um, I noticed that so much of your work, you know, you were talking and describing during the art, uh, opening that, um, you know, this work is uh, based off of a dream you might have or a reflection of a dream space or, or a memory space. So do you, do you keep a dream journal by your bed? 
I, okay, so I don't keep a dream journal, perhaps, but I do have, like, a journal, journal diary that I write my dreams in sometimes. If I um, have, like, a really intense dream, I'll, like, write it down, and I have, like, pages of, like, a single dream written in my journal, I guess, because I'll have, like, really intense dreams, but I also use some herbs, like, mugwort that can, like, help you better recall your dreams and, like, pro provides kind of, like, psychic, intuitive advances when you, like, make a tea out of it. Um, and I also have some, like, I have a big bundle of it hanging above my bed, like, right there. Um, so, um, I guess that helps me, like, explore the dream world more and explore the astral plane. <laughs> yeah. If that makes sense. No, that's cool. Do you ever play around with lucid dreaming? Like, are you able to you know, some of these, some of these works almost feel like you're, you're witnessing a dream or it's like a snapshot of the dream that you've had. Are you able to, when you're in these spaces, either in the dream space or reflecting on it afterwards, do you feel like you're in control? Like, do you, can you control those dreams or do you feel like you're aware within them? Um, yeah, sometimes. I think I do lucid dream sometimes, definitely. And, um, there are a lot of times that I like, I guess, can recall during a dream. I'm like, oh, I'm in a dream. Like, what should I do next or something? Or like, I'll, I'll have to remember this for later and like things like that. And I guess I've just always been like a really like vivid dreamer. So, um, or like been able to do that. And so um, I do definitely explore it. Sometimes I'm able to explore the dream space like you would the real world and be like, let's go over there and see what's happening or like things like that, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot of your work um, kind of taps into this idea of overcoming past traumas or, or dealing with current issues that you may be facing. Um, do you feel like, like making this type of work is almost like a, a therapeutic outlet where you're able to reconsider things that maybe you could be suppressing or something that you're working out? Like, do you think making this work is an outlet of therapy to an extent, possibly? Um, yeah, some of my work is like that. It, like, you know, some of it's exploring the dream space, some of it's exploring more like memory. Some of it is just like, it's just like my smaller paintings sometimes are just like fun or like whimsical. Mm -hmm. um, but my, I do definitely have paintings that are exploring like past traumatic experiences. And um, I'll, I a lot of times like if, I am um, also with the traumatic experiences, I guess I'm, um, if I have something that's like replaying in my brain a lot, um, like I'll like want to draw it out and I'll like draw it out and then I'll like, I'll like a point, like maybe symbolism to it or like um, personified objects or like, I'll like distort it and like make it different in a way, I guess. And then um, like paint it, sometimes I'll like paint it like rainbow colors or like pastel like bright colors like unusual colors so it's like kind of almost like taking something really dark and like scary and then like making it rainbow and bright and colorful and like bringing it into the light and then it's like not so like terrifying anymore because it's like and because i've like worked through that painting so it like i feel afterwards that i've like kind of let it go interesting if that makes sense <laughs> yeah totally um Aaron, your work, while conceptually somewhat different, also kind of taps into this idea maybe of like of trauma, but more so in the kind of taking points from advertising and popular culture and kind of remixing it to reconsider these beauty standards that, that we're all subject to every day through media. Um, do you feel like your work kind of bounces off some, those similar ideas of, of moving through um, baggage or trauma or anything like that um i guess related to baggage or trauma i would say that if there's anything in my life that i want to resolve i i don't necessarily use art in that way to um reference it directly for me art is more of a process to clear my mind and for me, like traumatic times or anything like that is something that I try to get away from as much as possible. So for me, I wouldn't necessarily recreate that experience. 
but uh, in terms of like advertising and stuff like that, that might have a, a psychological effect on somebody, whether they know it or not. Um, I do try to, I guess, create a different spin on those images, which unlike sky, I think I tend to make it darker than it actually is. So a lot of like fashion advertisements and stuff that I typically like am inspired by are super brightly colored. And so in contrast to sky, like sometimes I'll take the color out just to offer like a different narrative or make it a little bit darker. Uh, and sometimes the imagery that I use is actually a little bit more uh, like disturbing or violent potentially, depending on how you look at it. So mm -hmm. it's interesting, we kind of like almost flip flop uh, on the color and some like stylistic components. So that's, that's interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, the way that you view magazines or advertisements um, as you're walking around, say, you know, in a mall or flipping through a magazine or on TV, has, has the way that you started creating work um, really warped almost your way of, of viewing advertisements? When you see um, a photograph of somebody holding a shampoo bottle or whatever, do you start to uh, deconstruct that in your mind or how do you, how do you look at advertisement differently? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it's usually just something either like visual that jumps out at me, like a um, color or shapes or texture or you know something that, like that that might draw my eye towards it initially. But other times I look at an advertisement as like completely absurd and it's so like over the top that like that's you know what initially attracted me to the image. So I'll you know I'll play off of either of those two things, like a, a style element or just like the content of the image, which is like so backwards to me, you know? Do you find that advertisements don't really work on you too much then as a consumer? Well, it's hard to say, because I think a lot of it is like, we're not even fully aware of like what reaches us, but I, I tend to think that I look at it with like a bit of skepticism. <laughs> We had, uh, we had some viewers interested in your process. Um, and I guess I'm also curious, like, how do you find your source images? Like, are there, is there like a, you have like a collage or I'm sorry, a, a just kind of like a, a backstock of images that you're pulling from, or is it something that you found that you're remixing? Um, and then like from that, I know you, you have many printmaking processes that you're, you're working through and then you're painting on top of it. So I guess the question is like, do you have, when you think about starting a new piece, um, is it inspired by like a found object or does it come from an idea and then you find those reference images afterwards? Um, I would say that most of the time I start with either one image or a, a collection of images that I already have. So I've like, I've collected like tons of magazine images that I've been inspired by. And so something might spark my interest and then I kind of develop an idea off of that image. Um, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and then with the printmaking processes that, you're, that you use, um, I remember us having a conversation about kind of like the ethics of print where, you know, when you, when you have a screen print edition or litho edition, it's all about getting consistency over the edition. But I remember you saying you always found conflict with that because you, you were making each, each print its own piece, you know, like you weren't going for, and some of the work consistency, like you wanted to make everything um, like a piece of its own. And I guess I was just wanting to pick your brain about that conversation, like with, with print and how you're trying to get a, you know, an edition of, of a, single image the whole way, but yet you're remixing and changing each image um, or each print rather. I just found that that interesting. Yeah, I've, I've struggled with printmaking a little bit. I know I touched on this a little bit in the last video, but um, just like the, the nature of having to have, having everything like very clean and printing these editions to be perfect is like against how I typically work. Mm -hmm. And I like to be able to change things and so sometimes in the studio, I'll just takes, take editions that I already have. And I don't plan on necessarily 
using them for that purpose, but I, I will cut them up and rearrange them. Or if it's a, a failed print for whatever reason, like it, it uh, I didn't execute the, the printmaking process well enough, if it failed, I can use that image in another way. Sky, kind of the same question. Um, I've had the pleasure of seeing your work throughout the last few years um, kind of evolve uh, a bit. And I know that you tend to paint fairly large in a fairly large scale. Can you walk us a little bit through your painting process? Um, how do you start, uh, what's the ideation process on a, on a new painting look like for you? And roughly how long does it take for you to finish a painting? Yeah, I think for me, the first step of a painting normally is like, giving like an idea obviously <laughs> about something you know, like so we have memory um and it depends on like what kind of painting it is because i do have some paintings where i just start painting and i just see like where it goes so normally that's like a smaller like just more for fun painting um and my like fairly large work i do like i feel like i take a lot more seriously where i um like for instance like with this painting I had this idea for like maybe a few months um, of me and my ex-partner and being like, hey, we should, because like, we were always during quarantine lying in this empty like field um, in Pittsburgh um, and like looking at the, the clouds or whatever. And there was always like dandelions and all this stuff, which is which in, what's in this painting. Um, and so for like a few months, I was like, I'm going to this painting, I'm going to this painting, but I was working on other paintings, like the ones you see in the show. Um, and when we got to the farm, I was like, let's, I want to have this painting like now. So I had, like we both took pictures of each other lying in the grass and then I started sketching those. Um, and then um, once I get like some general ideas down of like what I want to do, or, like what the composition I want, um, things like that, then I like, um, I take a piece of masonite like this and I paint it, like basically gesso it with like acrylic or latex paint mostly, or like gesso. Um, and then I like sketch on the board with pencil or like light paint. And then I um, just start painting, <laughs> I guess. Normally with like a like layer of acrylic, um, again, to like build more like um, opaqueness with the board, a layer of acrylic down, or to start with oil, oil paint, and then I just like go to, to this. Um, but um, it depends. I feel like a lot of paintings maybe take me around a month, but paintings like my um, birthday painting in the show, and a painting like this, and my birthday painting from my last show at, um, I think this show, I take like maybe three months because I like, some paintings I just like get really into and it's hard to get out because it's hard to just stop because you can just keep adding things everywhere. Um, but yeah, that's my process. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm always interested in, in uh, artistic process, like knowing just enough uh, to, to be like, oh yes, something like that, but not being an artist myself right now, like a working artist, I'm just always very interested in hearing about um, how an artist uh, takes an idea and, and finishes it. So thank you both. Thanks. Um, Sky, I know, uh, and I've seen your work before and I've seen um, shows of yours in the past uh, that you tend to incorporate um, some sort of performance sometimes into your show, like a performance piece and that you have worked in, in dance as well. Um, if this show had taken place outside of COVID, if we were all able to attend an actual opening in the gallery, would, would this show have contained a piece of performance for you? Um, yeah, I was kind of planning on it uh, pre-COVID, um, talking with some of my friends I danced with, especially because it was in Columbus. I um, have a lot of, like, I have a large dance community there of people who would probably be, like, interested in, like, doing a multiple person performance or, like, hopefully something like that, like I did for my thesis show. So, um, like, I was planning on maybe doing, like, a little bit of, like, movement or performance, maybe particularly, like, with the ladders or in the space or, like, um, adding, like, more sculptural works, but, like, 
obviously like that didn't happen. There wasn't like an opening really. So it was like, um, it, it didn't happen, but I was kind of planning something um, before like things got really uncertain with COVID and stuff. Do you consider performances to be an extension of the paintings themselves, an extension of the work or how does performance play into uh, experiencing your work? Um, yeah, I think it is kind of an extension of the work because like, um, I sometimes think of the performance as like extension of like the figure of the work. A lot of my work is self portraiture. So it's like if I'm performing that I kind of like maybe stepped out of this painting and like was like dancing or something, you know, or like what, how would this character in this painting move? Like will they move like really slow or um, like really fast or something? <laughs> um, and, and I also like to think like, and like um, in like dance psychology or whatever, like that type of dance it's like like how do you tell a narrative how do you tell a story through your movement like from start to finish how is that like a narrative story so i think of that too when i'm like moving like with a performance for the piece is like how can we take the story from this work and then make it into a journey you watch through movement so um yeah <laughs> and i also like to incorporate similar colors like into like when I'm like what we're wearing or um, into like props or sculptures I use in the performance. Um, yeah. Erin, <laughs> have you ever considered using performance in any of your work or is that something that you've ever played with in the past in undergrad or in your um, graduate studies? Uh, no, I tend to work like, I'm like a hermit, I guess. <laughs> uh, I don't really seek out I don't really like to put myself out there. Like I, I like to put my artwork out there, but I don't like to put my personal self out there, like in a performance sense. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely more of a private experience making the artwork. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm more uh, generally a more shy person. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. Uh, it's always good to be kind of behind the scenes sometimes for sure. Yeah. Um, I wanted to bring up uh, the body of work in the show spans quite a broad length of time. Um, and with that, the work still is all so, um, you know, it still, still talks to each other and it's all kind of touching on these similar themes still. And uh, I just wanted to, to ask you if, um, if the, the theme of this work is going to continue possibly for the, for the next 10 years, because, you know, one of your pieces, I believe, is from 2010. So that's quite a, um, you know, as prolific as you are, it's impressive to see that the theme has continued for this long. Um, yeah, so I, I generally have been working with this idea for a long time. Um, I've switched gears throughout the years to work on sort of other concepts and topics, but I thought like selecting the pieces for this show, even though they span, you know, a long period of time, like you said, I did think that they went together well, even though they're a little bit different, like in terms of media or, or style or, you know, process, but that's why I chose them to go together. Um, they, I, I did find that they related on a conceptual level. So I, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, no, it's, it's great to see it. I, I almost want to talk about process again for our viewers. Um, when you, is there something that lithography or screen printing does for your work that cannot be attainable through graphite solely alone? Um, or how does, I guess, how does the process of printmaking um, kind of inspire the, the piece from a conceptual background, I guess, if that makes sense. <laughs> sure. Um, let me, let me have a second on this one. Yeah. Um, I don't know yeah. if I want, I don't know if it's worth explaining the whole lithography process. We might not have time for that, but <laughs> I guess just like I'm a, honestly, I'm a little interested because I don't know much about litho whatsoever. So yeah, sure. I I, I thought the question was going to be about litho and like how. So I did. I guess I would say um, for anyone interested in lithography, it's generally just a printmaking process where you would draw. Uh, with lithographic crayons or other materials on a stone or a metal plate. And then you would 
through a chemical process, etch your drawing so that it's made permanent in the stone and or plate. And then you can ink it, you know, run it through a press and then have multiple copies. Mm -hmm. um, so like, just for, for an example, like something that I struggled with litho with is that like while you're working on the stone, you cannot touch the stone with your actual hands or like Mm -hmm. You cannot rest your arm on the stone because like the oils from your skin will actually end up being a part of the image. So like I haven't done a lithograph in a long time, but I would have these like paranoid nightmares where I, you know, had my hands on the stone at one point in time and I'm like thinking that it's going to end up in the image. So it's just stuff like that where you have to be super careful and aware of like every step in the process and that can be difficult for me because I like if you saw my studio right now like I'm pretty messy so like having to be that careful like at all times is a challenge um but in terms of my process that I'd say there's certain things that you can get out of a print or like a screen print for example um texture wise I like to be able to have like large flats of color that are hard to get either with painting or it's definitely not something I can get with graphite um, mm. but just you know a visual concern if I need those that sort of element then I would turn to screen printing for that which is helpful or um, like intaglio printing I've really liked doing etchings because even though it's still kind of ri a rigid printmaking process I feel like you have more freedom uh, you can like redraw things or you know etch something longer and change things or scrape things out so I'm a little bit more drawn to processes where you where it allows you to change the image after the fact yeah litho is litho is scary I've definitely had those nightmares too from undergrad where, you know every mark you make is permanent with that oil based litho crayon so every mark is never going away so that's a it's a scary thought for sure <laughs> Sky, you've also, uh, you, you touched a little bit earlier on the ladders that are up in the exhibition. So you, you as well have um, dabbled in multimedia work. When did you first become aware of enjoying using um, sculpture methods uh, as opposed to just uh, painting on canvas? When did you start incorporating sculpture? Um, like prior to coming to CCAD, I was like really, only in like not like only into but like I was really like oh I'm a 2D artist I love to paint I want to be a painter um I like to draw as well but like mostly it was like painting um and mostly all watercolor um and then when I came to CCD I did that for like a few years I was like oh I'm gonna paint and stuff but because obviously CCD makes you dabble in a lot of other things including like sculpture classes obviously required um and like you're required to make 3D work and other work, I decided to like stop painting and just like do everything else I could possibly do and explore that. Um, maybe like um, my sophomore and junior year, I was kind of like, I'm gonna do ceramics and sculpture and performance and like poetry and silkscreen and um, like all these, like everything else you could possibly do, I guess. Cause I wanted to try everything and like um, find different ways of making um, related to the same topic with different media. Um, and I made those sculptures in my advanced sculpture class with Danielle Julia Norian um, my last semester of CCD, which was um, last year. And um, hello. Um, <laughs> okay, what day? Um, I, I like, I'm, I, my senior year, I ended up going back to being a painter again because I was like, actually, I do love painting and I miss painting a lot. Money. <laughs> um, um, if that makes sense. And um, I definitely like want to keep being a painter, but I also want to incorporate other things into my work. Um, because I think that it's really like I had like ladders as a theme in my paintings for a while, maybe like a few years or something. And in the end of my drawings were like a theme of ladders. And so I decided like, what if I like made this into like a sculptural object and like a series of sculptural objects 
all made out of different material to explore different sculptural materials that you can make, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking about um, during the opening, uh, you talked about this, uh, this concept, this idea of uh, if you're in a situation that you don't like having like this ladder come down and you can just take that ladder and get out of the situation. And I'm just thinking of like, um, given unlimited resources and time, how much I would love to explore an installation by you where we can literally take these ladders into different rooms or into different spaces that you've created. Um, what, what would you, what would you do if, if today you had unlimited resources and unlimited time? What would be like your dream show to put together right now? Or would you, would you have like a, a, a place that you'd want to take that? Um, as far as ladders or as far as I think? Just anything, yeah. Where, where would you take that show if right now you, you were like, I can do anything I want? Anything I want. I, yeah, I mean, I have some ideas, I guess. I guess I would have like, huge paintings like beautiful like but also really weird and um and like surreal i guess like it, but really detailed it's like what i want and then i probably would make some sculptures and do like um dance with like a large group of people in a large space and dance around the sculptures and i like we're probably like i have this idea actually of making this ladder like that's like built for a certain space but um if i like I, whatever and like having a ladder that like hangs from the ceiling all the way down to the floor um like exactly and it's like made out of like like, like string or hair like really intricate like like woven hair or braided hair and like like it's like a ladder that's like like you can't use it obviously but it, like it's just coming up in the ceiling like very like ephemeral like I guess like maybe like silver or something that's like that's that's like my dream I guess with the, like as far as ladders yeah. <laughs> um but um, like if I had unlimited resources I probably would also make like a ton more ceramics and have like a ceramic house installation or something or like use all my work and like use an old house and like completely install the whole house to have like you can walk through the whole house. All the rooms are different installations awesome. with paintings like on the walls and stuff. So yeah. make like the whole world. <laughs> yeah. like I Aaron, take us through the same the same idea. Uh, I, I like this question. Like yeah. today you were presented with unlimited resources to do the show that you've always wanted to do. To walk us through it. Boy, that's a tough one. <laughs> um <laughs> get a six foot tall uh, lithostone, right? <laughs> oh boy, that sounds like a nightmare to me. But, uh, I would say um, I would probably return to some larger work, some like really large paintings. Because um, lately I've been limited by the size of my studio and limited by like certain media. Like I, I'm working mostly in drawing and painting right now because that's, it's, I have access to it in my studio. I don't have to I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to have like a press or any of, the, of these materials so I can do it at home. But my studio is a really small room and I can't really work that large right now. So that, I guess that would be something I would look forward to for another show is working large again and um, yeah. Yeah, sounds like there's, there's some commonality there. Um, I know. If I were to get back into painting as well or making work, I, I love working in large scale. That, that idea of unlimited resources and becoming a scale, an issue of scale, right? Like being able to scale up and make larger and larger and larger works. Yeah. Um, Sky, you kind of touched a little bit uh, in that last question on this idea of a home that you could walk through room by room. Um, that home pops up often as a, as a theme in some of your pieces. Um, what what does home represent to you in your pieces and in life? And then kind of tying that a little bit into, you've done some residencies recently, which are um, not permanent home spaces. They are places that you live in very temporary moments in time. Um, kind of just, I would love to know a little bit more about where that home pops up in your work and why. 
Um, yeah, I do make a lot of work um, relating to or like taking place in like the home, the domestic setting, I guess, um, and using the imagery from the domestic life um, or like the familiarity of that. Um, like those ob of those like objects that like we all have like probably seen like a tea kettle or like a bathroom sink or like like those like um like familiar mundane things I guess um and I think I'm like exploring that a lot because like um I don't know I feel like it's just like maybe like kind of like a craving for me to have a home like situation um but I'm also like really terrified of that. And that's why I'm like, I feel like I'm like constantly kind of like running from like place to place and like living out of my minivan or like traveling around. And like, I love that a lot actually, but it's also something I'm thinking about now is like how and where should I like settle so I can like get more stable and like being able to have paintings. Like right now this is like in my bedroom, like being able to have paintings out, like not having to like go put them in a car and have them in a car for two weeks or something, you know? Um, um, but because I was like, um, like because I don't have like a family anymore, I think I really like use those like home, I like imagery and iconography to like talk about that, um, or to like represent that. And I use a particular like, like, like aqua blue house with like two windows or whatever as like this like idea of like oh like those memories from like my childhood home are like in that house and that's like where they stay kind of thing or like if I want to think about it I'll go back to that house and I'll like unlock it or something you know I guess I use it like as a container um for those things and so that blue house like kind of pops up in like the background of a lot of paintings um at least like recently within like the past like year or two um, and, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's just, um, I either make work about the home because it's like, it's kind of fun and wonky and weird and funny sometimes, but it also is like kind of this darker thing of being like, um, like thinking about times when I've been homeless or thinking about times when I've been, um, like having unstable housing or, um, like, losing my family and like everything I knew at that like house kind of thing and like kind of missing that and so it's like I think it's exploring a lot of different like avenues yeah thank you for walking us through that yeah yeah Sky there's this theme of the um the dollhouse in many of your pieces that that blue dollhouse and you kind of touched on the story during the virtual opening but I remember you, remember you telling me that story and it was it was really great. I didn't know if you wanted to bring that up again, um, just how that motif kind of plays out through a bunch of those pieces in the show. Um, yeah, I forgot that like I, cause I, um, you know, I've been so obsessed with this blue house and then I um, wrote this like last fall, I wrote a poems, I wrote poems and I, um, made a lot of paintings involving the Blue Doll House, which are now on the show, um, which is like very similar to this Blue House that I like. Um, like it's a dollhouse version of the Blue House that I like iconography, like, am like obsessed with, I guess. And so I forgot, I forgot about those pieces in the show for some reason about the Blue Doll House. <laughs> but like you're right, like when it's like a similar thing when I was like a little kid, um, the story is or whatever. When I was a little kid, my mom had this blue like Victorian old dollhouse that her dad had like built her, but he never finished it because he was manic depressive and like got depressed and never finished it. So it was like, it was like unfinished, um, but like the siding was missing, like window panes were missing, but most, it was the structure of the dollhouse, the structure of the dollhouse was there. Um, and she kept it on top of this really large cabinet um, in the at the bottom of the basement stairs. So, um, in my childhood home. So when I'd be like walking down these basement stairs as a little kid, I would just see this like large old blue dollhouse at the bottom of the stairs, but up on a really high cabinet where I could like, couldn't reach it or couldn't see it besides when I'm at the top of the stairs. And um, 
I guess I would just like always imagine like what it was like on the inside as like this kid and I like one time asked my mom like mom can you like turn it around so I can like imagine to be playing on the inside of the dollhouse and she was just kind of like what why would I why would why would you want me to do that but then she was like okay and she like turned it around so I could like see the inside of it and when I was like 10 I like kind of inherited it and I like tried to like refinish it as like a 10 year old. I tried to put in like, I put like stickers on like the walls of the inside and stuff <laughs> and paper, like wallpaper. Um, but um, that dollhouse like kind of like, um, I guess it's like representing this like kind of like longing um, for like childhood and like longing for like play and discovery and like longing for that like home feeling, I guess, that um, I've been like kind of exploring in my work, as well as like I started having just like really intense memories about it. Like those, that story I just shared or like other things where I was like, um, was like, okay, like I need to explore this like empty dollhouse kind of situation, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that mo that motif is so interesting. I appreciate you sharing that for sure. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Aaron, I kind of wanted, I had a, I had a question um, that's popped up on uh, social that was a question about your work in this, this, um, the subject matter of marketing and ads and seeing uh, a human form manipulated in a way. Um, and so when we see that in marketing and ads and in your work is, is sort of talking about this manipulation of, of how uh, one might see themselves um, with Snapchat and Instagram filters, like that selfie filter, how uh, that distorts our image of ourselves. Do you find that that like enhances or hinders this version of beauty that we see in ourselves? Like, do you, do you see that Snapchat, or Instagram selfie filter as a hindrance to ourself and our beauty standards, or do you see it as us uh, benefiting or, or or becoming more comfortable with ourselves and our beauty? Um, I would say my general opinion of that is pretty negative. Um, uh, based on, like, say, the imagery that I use, like magazine advertisements and stuff like that. Um, most of these images are probably, you know, heavily photoshopped at some point. So there's this sort of illusion of perfection, which I think translates over to, you know, Instagram and selfies and these filters, which I think also provide this illusion of perfection, at least in terms of people taking pictures of themselves or other people and editing them, you know, to fit this mold. So I think it's, there's definitely some crossover between, you know, advertising and uh, selfies and stuff like that. But I guess one of the things that is, is different about it is that in a magazine, you know, this is a paid model that is advertising like a very specific product or a specific idea. And now, you know, with, with selfies or filters, it's like, what are we what are we using this for? Like, what's the goal? So I, I think it's destructive, especially for young people and maybe people who can't separate themselves from, you know, the idea of what these filters are used for. Mm -hmm. um, that would be my general viewpoint. I'm sure people find like good uses for filters, you know, but I think generally it's about like perfection, like creating like a perfect image of your life or a perfect image of yourself that is really false and uh, is, is potentially dangerous in my opinion. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. Um, it's like suddenly we as consumers have been given editorial power over our own image. And is that, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing, right? Um, do we need to have editorial power over our image in such a way? Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like we're leading, you know, two lives, you know, we are curating this digital persona as well as our physical persona. Um, yeah, there's a there's a lot there for sure. I noticed just looking at your work now, a lot of 
a lot of the content of the work is, you know, it's about identity and self image and you have multiple layers and multiple faces and different positions and different, different emotions. Um, do you think the, the work is talking about this kind of like split, split identity between these two worlds that we're curating at the same time? Um, yeah, I think so, because I, like I'm directly responding to the types of images, like these images of perfection in magazines and stuff, but I'm also putting my own like personal spin on it and how I view these. So it's like simultaneously a reflection of like what's out there, but also like, at least for me internally, like what I'm trying to put out into the image that I'm making. So I guess in a way there's like a process of editing that you might say is similar to Photoshop where, you know, I say I'm cropping things or resizing things or changing the colors of things. So I guess that's something that I haven't totally thought about before, but that there is like this process of editing and um, changing these images to fit something that I want. I got you. Yeah, a lot of the, before I learned about the, um, the conceptual background with, with how it's attached to advertising and media, just at first glance, you know, these, some of these images are, you know, the, the work is kind of sinister and it's, it's dark and I, I love that about it. Um, almost you. reminds me of like, like an ego death or something where you have all these different personas clashing and melting and going over each other. And yeah. it's, it's very strong. I just, I, I love your work. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sky, I have, I have one last question for myself, uh, personally, and um, one of my favorite works in the show of, of yours is The Birthday of Al Alternative Personalities, um, which you've touched on uh, previous in this hour, talking to us where you, you've uh, painted this, this uh, event of your birthday with, with uh, your different selves represented there. Um, I enjoy it. It's, it's, it's joyful and it's it's a it's cause for celebration and um i was just wondering if uh you know five years from now at another birthday um do you see yourself uh adding new aspects or what new aspects of yourself that would you like to see added into that painting um if you were to recreate it in a, in a future birthday um I guess I'm not sure because I'm not sure what will things will be like in five years. I guess I can hope that like, um, you know, it's like me and like, or like five years, like feeling like, like five years better of like painting and like living life and doing all that stuff, I guess. Um, but um, the, the, I have done like two back to back years of doing like a large birthday painting, like, um, for myself, my last one was, um, um, a painting of like me and like my family and then, like a few of my friends, but like they all were like personified into like objects and it was like kind of like a fake birthday, like, um, painting, which I painted like about my birthday. I did this, a similar thing this year, but I was more like what if I don't include the people like that hurt me I just have myself but it's like all like personified actors of myself um and so next year I'd like to do maybe another birthday painting and like keep it going for years and years yeah. uh, just as like a celebratory thing for myself I guess and just because birthdays are like fun and like kind of weird and like um kind of go in that space again of like thinking about memory and like childhood and like um like how would you like throw a birthday for yourself if you could like do it how you wanted or like like how would you throw a birthday for yourself if like um you didn't have um like people to throw that birthday party for you or something you know um and so also, I guess that's like I think that's what I'm doing like with my paintings is um just doing it um doing a little nice thing for myself through a painting I guess yeah but also kind of like documenting the year, but I'm not sure what things will be like in five years, but I hope that they're like, uh, that like things go up from here, I guess. 
I, I hope that you continue to do these birthday series. I think a great show, you know, down the road, I would love to see a retrospective of your birthday paintings, uh, you know, down the road. I think that'd be really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll see. Yeah. I had another question too. Um, just with your space living in the same room for enough time, uh, they kind of start to talk to each other. And I was just wondering if you two had spent enough time looking at each other's work where, you know, having the show together, um, have you been like influenced by each other at any point or, you know, taken hints and cues that you'd like to introduce into your own work or anything like that? Like how is the exhibition um, inspired uh, working through the future, I guess, if it has influenced you in any way? having the show together? Um, I think one of the things that I was struck by initially was like uh, the size of Sky's paintings, which like I mentioned before, if I could do another show, I'd probably try to work a bit larger. So it was nice to see those large paintings and it kind of like inspired me to maybe like branch out of my comfort zone. Like I've been working so small lately that, you know, I think that would be a refreshing change. Um, I noticed that there are certain ways that we use color similarly. Um, like I know I've talked about uh, like a lot of my graphite works, I'll, I'll tend to take the color out of like my, so my reference photos and stuff like that. But I do have like some colorful pieces too that I think uh, our brightly colored works can complement each other. Um, so that was one of the things I noticed too. Very cool. Is there, was there anything for you, Sky? Um, yeah, I think I was, like when I was installed, I think I was really drawn to um, like Aaron's like detail and like the surreal kind of like spinning aspects of your pieces. And particularly when I like, got close, I was like, oh my God, that is graphite. Like that's all graphite. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> like whatever I was like oh my gosh that's so cool that you like just took a pencil and you just went to town and um like I it kind of made me like want to go back to that a little bit sometimes because I was um I used to do like really intricate maybe like a, two years ago really intricate drawings like um surreal landscapes with just pencil um because I didn't have a lot of other supplies with me and I remember telling my friend Destiny I was like why am I not like just using graphite like on the farm because when I was working on the farm it was really hard to get the time and space to like set up paintings and paint I really wanted to paint but it was like there I was painting outside so there were so many like elements and so it definitely inspired me I think to um like just allow myself to work on paper more again and like Play around with like things like graphite um again that like i think i felt like i was like oh like painting is like the end all be all like it's the best i love painting but i was like i can also just like do some drawings and stuff too like um and i think that like in like seeing your work definitely inspired like that and also like me like wanting to continuously push the surreal edge of my work i want to continue to push it more and more into that space and I saw that happening with your work because of like how things were distorted or like it was just like half a face or like um like more abstract line work and um so I definitely like was like wow this is really cool and I'm like seeing these things in this work um <laughs> and then it was like inspiring me to to try different avenues as well so <laughs> awesome yeah. I appreciate you saying that um I guess you mentioned something about uh, painting being like the be all end all. And I think there, there's definitely a hierarchy of m like media. So I think a lot of people like dismiss graphite as like uh, something that you would use for sketching or it's like a practice run. And a lot of people see it as like not an image, like a final image in itself. So that's one of the things that I, I reject, I guess, is that I think it can be something in itself and works on paper too. I think a lot of people like 
on the hierarchy of things, place works on paper, like below works on canvas or, um, so I, I just reject that. Uh, it's definitely like a traditional thing. And I don't know, I guess I just appreciate you drawing attention to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, that's like something I mentioned that like, I want to get out to. Um, I think it's been a lot of just like people telling me that like, oh, this is a really nice drawing. Too bad it's like with graphite or like it's on paper and it's not like a, like, oh, you should just move that into a painting. You should just paint that. Like, and I'm like, I spent like three months on this huge ass <laughs> drawing and it's like a good piece. Like I don't need to like go and yeah. remake that just because it should be on canvas or something. Right. And there's stuff that's lost in the process too, right? Like, um, like putting something with graphite on paper, the, the, the strokes used, the detail given, the time in it can be lost if you try to translate that into a painting. There's, there's an emotion almost that's lost too. And so, yeah, I mean, it, you're right. Both of you are right. There shouldn't have to be like this hierarchy. It should be a fluid movement um, between these mediums and, and they should be weighted equally. Yeah. 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 Erin, how many times have your screen prints been called paintings? I get that all the time. Yeah, definitely. Nice painting. <laughs> yeah. <Thank you. laughs> nice. Um, well, so uh, did you guys receive any other feedback from viewers or anybody that had uh, come through the show, witnessed it online or come through during our open hours at all? Um, any feedback that, you know, uh, friends or strangers have given you that you're going to take with you? Um, I guess I noticed, so I recently created an Instagram account for my art, which I've been like holding off on doing, but uh, I've noticed that some people have actually posted images of my work that, you know, went to the show in person and then posted, you know, a photo of my work on Instagram. And so I really appreciated that, especially during this time where I'm not necessarily meeting any of these people or seeing these people in the gallery in person. So it's nice to see that people are making it there and are interacting with the work and that it, it's having an effect on people. So I am getting good feedback. It is largely digital oriented feedback right now, but I'm, I'm really happy to be getting some feedback, yeah. I'm glad to hear that too. Sky, I know that you had a some folks come through um, to see your work. Some professors, some old professors come through and, and see. Yeah. yeah. Some professors, some friends, and, um, you know, friends of those friends, I guess. <laughs> um, so um, that was nice. I guess, like, obviously it wasn't enough. It wasn't, like, as many people as would have been if there was, like, an actual opening. But it was, like, really cool that people did work. I, like, told some people about it and that they were, like, oh yeah, like, I'll come be there for you, like, I'll support you, and so that was, I felt like my, like, top fans were there. <laughs> um, people who, like, came out during a pandemic to see and see me, so that's cool. Um, and I have had some people reach out to me, like, on Instagram to, like, message me with, like, questions and stuff, um, or feedback, um, and I did get one kind of strange question um, from someone that I didn't know, but who had come and see my work. Um, and the question was, um, I mean, I guess it's not super strange, but it just was some guy who was asking like, why is there like a lack of masculine or male characters or figures in your work? Um, and um, I guess I was kind of like shocked by this question because I was like, I don't feel like they're necessarily like lacking, but I feel like I'm, mostly choosing to paint um other things that aren't that doesn't necessarily include that but also um a majority of my paintings are like i use myself as a model or i use my friends as like models because that's like what i have available to photograph without being weird i guess you know and so myself and then most of my friends are like queer non-binary femme or like afab people and so I'm not necessarily like, including a lot of like masculine figures in my work. Um, but yeah, that was a question I got. Um, interesting. Um, a man. Yeah, like an absence of a male figure doesn't necessarily mean a lacking of a male figure, right? Like, yeah, yeah, the just the absence of it doesn't necessarily mean that that something is, yeah. 
find that to be interesting that that's what they decided to focus on but yeah, that's yeah. I think that's interesting mm -hmm. well I was just gonna ask um you know in the coming months in the coming year uh you know 20 the rest whatever is left of 2020 and um as we look forward to 2021 um where can viewers um new fans of your work find you um you know uh, give a shout to your instagram handle if you feel comfortable doing so or are you working towards any shows uh or residencies next year yeah my work is on my my art instagram is sky day underscore and underscore monet <laughs> <laughs> monet's instagram monet come here yeah sleepy i mean he's sleepy i don't know <laughs> um and i my work is on my website which i need to renew but i will do that today hopefully i have a computer um my website is um sky day at squarespace.com um i think and um i was supposed to be at a residency right now but it was canceled because of covid I'm supposed to be in vermont but um obviously it's not happening um so right now i'm like taking time to like focus on like painting um and i'm applying to a lot of shows and residencies mostly shows because i don't know when residencies are going to be back like open but um i'm like using this time to apply to new things right now so i don't think i have anything coming up we'll definitely uh make sure to alert people through our email and social when they can uh when you have another show coming up so that people can follow oh, I, guess I'm, I do have a show um which will probably be an online like pamphlet version and possibly an in live ver version next year um at bunker projects um for my residency yeah that's um, right. which i don't know when it's coming out but eventually <laughs> everything's kind of on hold right now I understand yeah. yeah Aaron what about you where where does the next year take you um work wise residency wise uh show wise what do you got what's on the horizon um so right now I'm focused on making new work at home uh I would like to apply to a show or two and, and see what happens in the next year or so um but I definitely want to make a, a solid body of work too and focus on that um, in terms of where people can find me, uh, my Instagram is E.M. Cameron, uh, nine, you know, at Instagram or whatever. And then my website is AaronCameronStudio.com. Um, so that's where you can find some more of my work and yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Andy, did you think of what you wanted to say? Um, yeah, I, um, Aaron, when you were saying that the work had an effect on people in the gallery, I was just curious on what that effect was or what, what is the effect you're trying to have the viewer experience when they do see your work as they leave the gallery? Um, what they take away after they see the show? I think that's an individual thing. Um, <laughs> so I don't like to necessarily spell things out in my work. I like to kind of give general references to themes but also allow people to to find their own meaning in it so it's like i'm providing maybe like myself and the viewer can meet halfway like i'll i'll provide some something to go off of and they kind of provide like their own personal interpretation and and take what they will from the pieces um i'm not sure exactly what specifically people are getting from it um i do see comments just I guess appreciating the work, which you know makes me feel pretty good, but uh, I'm not entirely sure on an indiv indiv individual basis, you know, what people are getting from it. Um, I'd like to think um, they have a, a sense of what I'm pointing towards, like questioning uh, imagery, um, mm -hmm. and I guess you know the gen general themes that we've talked about already. But I, I wish I could talk to these people in person and, and ask them, you know, how it has affected them. Yeah, totally. Sky, what's your perspective on that? Do you, um, are you trying to persuade the viewer in any way or is it a similar thing where you're 
kind of leaving things open-ended for their own interpretation? Um, I think both. I think, um, like, obviously I get, um, give them a little bit of information or, like, story, but I guess if you, and it probably depends on, like, how well you know my work previously and how well you know me and, like, my story or something, but, um, or, like, what you've read, but I, I don't like to give them the whole, like, cake, I guess, you know, like, some of the Aaron, like, kind of, like, lead them in a direction but if they get something totally different from my work then that's like their interpretation and that's okay like i think everyone's going to like approach um my work and probably leave like feeling or noticing something different than someone else did so um like that's how i feel about it i guess um but i guess i also do try to be like this is what my work like this is what my work's about or like this is like where i'm I'm coming from about this piece or something when people like are interested. Gotcha. Yeah, it's cool to see that the different perspectives. Yeah, I guess for me too, um, I've never wanted to think that my work can't function without me being there. Like, yeah. I don't want to think that I have to be like be there to explain the work. I like to think that the work can, you know, offer something itself without me having to explain it. So that's my goal. I don't know if I always meet that goal, um, but I, I'd like to think that it can speak on its own too. Yeah, definitely. Well, I really appreciate both of you taking some time this afternoon to meet with Andy and I to give us uh, more uh, an in-depth look into your process, into your work, into your inspiration. Um, as well as our viewers, uh, you know, I think that these artist talks are so important, um, especially right now as we start to ease into um, inviting people back into the gallery. Uh, right now, it's for safety reasons, we can't have like big, large gatherings. And so there's been a, a piece that's sort of missing as far as being able to ask artists, you know, during openings, um, all the questions that they want to ask the artists. And I think that is so important to have that connection between viewer and artist. And so Andy and I are just playing a conduit right now, a conduit between our, our viewers out there and you as artists and, and trying to um, peel back the mystique of, of, uh, of the artist and uh, the life and the paintings and the, and the works. Um, so thank you for guiding us through that this afternoon. Um, it's been a real pleasure talking to both of you. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure for me too. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So um, again, thank you to all of our viewers out there um, and our supporters. If you enjoyed today's conversation, um, head on over to 934gallery.org where you can view all the work that we discussed uh, and more um, over on our website. You can, uh, Follow our artists on Instagram, follow us on Instagram. Um, join us for a gallery opening in the future. Um, stay tuned as uh, COVID evolves and, and we can hopefully move to more uh, in-person gallery openings and in-person artist talks. Um, make sure to check our website for information on that. And if you were so compelled to do so today, uh, based off of what we've been able to give you, Feel free to make a donation to 934 Gallery. We are a 100% volunteer run organization. Um, not a single one of us takes a dime for what we do. Um, we're just excited to showcase the artists uh, today and to showcase artists continuously in the future. So um, just wanted to sign off and say thanks again to all of our viewers out there. Thank you, Andy, for joining me. Thank you, Aaron and Sky as well. So. Thank you. Well, thanks, everyone. Take care, y'all.